on business and corporate today. Window of Turkey asks for collaboration on agricultural development with Africa. Uganda Internet, second most expensive in the world. And uh, Liberia receives final financial package from World Bank. Good afternoon. Welcome to Business Incorporated here on Channels Television. I'm Amy John Mekwa. Oh, well, let's start as usual with equities in Nigeria. It's bad news. Uh, the equities has dropped from that 49,000 points that we had to 48,000 at intraday and it's down 0.12%. While the opposite is what we have in South Africa, the JSE is up almost 2.5%. Uh, it would be nice to find out what's driving that market at intraday. And uh, going to other parts of uh, the continent, Egypt is also in the positive more than 2%, 2.17%, while Kenya closed yesterday in the red, 0.38%. We move over to the Middle East now and see how that market is faring, and it's all positive for major markets that we track in the Middle, Middle East. Abu Dhabi up almost 1.5% at 9,909.08, while Dubai is also up 1.80%. Uh, we also saw a green market yesterday, so following up on that sentiment at 3,300. Plus, uh, Saudi is also positive 1.38%, 11,767.76, while Qatar uh, took it even a notch many notches higher, 3.47%, almost 3.5% up uh, at intraday. And that's what we have for the market. Uh, just before we go to the Asia market, let's see what's going on uh, in Europe. And uh, what's happening in Europe is that uh, Germany's massive financial shield to help households and companies pay for high energy prices is drawing a lot of criticism on the European uh, level. EU finance ministers have discussed the size of the aid package at their meeting uh, in Luxembourg. But we have uh, Chris Corbyn now joining us from Berlin uh, to give us a bigger picture, a fuller picture of what that is about. Hi, Chris. Uh, good afternoon. One would have thought that uh, this aid will receive a lot of applause, but uh, what really is the bone of contention here? <laughs> It is the size of the aid package that has EU officials outside of Germany worried. Uh, Germany aims to spend around 200 billion euros or $190 billion on measures like a gas price cap. Now, 200 billion euros, we have to understand that amounts to about half of the regular German budget. Many EU countries have announced national programs to shield consumers from high prices, but Germany went the furthest here. Uh, its response to the energy crisis is far larger than the uh, 67 billion euros announced by France and the 68 billion euros planned by Italy. While the support was welcomed here in Germany uh, and by financial markets, it raised concern in other EU countries that cannot afford to spend nearly that much. The concern in uh, some capitals is that their industries could take severe blows while Germany's sits on, uh, sits protected, deforming the EU's single market. Indeed, independent experts have been saying that if the German gas price break gives German business a much better chance to survive the crisis than, say, uh, Italian businesses, uh, economic divergences in the EU could be deepened and European unity on Russia undermined. So it might not come as a surprise that outgoing Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi has slammed Berlin for what he called lack of solidarity and coordination with EU partners. And uh, French Finance Minister Bruno Le Maire, without directly criticizing Berlin, called on partners to agree on a common strategy against the price shock and for countries to refrain from going at it alone. Mm. So uh, there's been defense going on. Uh, Germany's uh, finance minister has been defending. What's the defense? 
Christian Lindner said that uh, the German government, in fact, did not do economic stimulation here, but as he put it, uh, was dampering ruinous price peaks. The aid package would be proportionate to the size and the vulnerability of the German economy, Mr. Lindner said, adding that, in his opinion, it had the character of a protective cushion, one that isn't just meant for this year, but that also covers the period of next year and 2024. German experts have also been pointing, pointing to the fact that support measures in other European countries have been uh, in part in place uh, for some time now. And as for the question how the bloc wants to proceed now, well, in short, finance ministers agreed um, to disagree, uh, all sides pretty much holding <clears throat> their ground. But they did pledge that uh, national financial shields against soaring energy costs would be coordinated, temporary, and targeted, so as not to trigger a wage price spiral uh, that would boost already record inflation. The reference to inflation is a nod to the European Central Bank, which is seeking to curb record fast price growth with a series of steep rate increases. Inflation in the 19 countries that share the euro currency reached 10% last month. And the size of total Eurozone government help for the economy, which already exceeds half a trillion euros, works against uh, the ECB's efforts as the support pumps more money into the economy and distorts price signals from the market. Yeah, well, finding a balance is, is a difficult one, balancing the aid and the inflation that may come over. How is the market reacting? Well, it turned out to be a positive start to the month yesterday, and that sentiment has been spilling over into today's trading session. Uh, Germany's blue chips index DAX uh, advancing around 1.3% in the early parts uh, of today's trading, with the traditionally weak trading month of September behind them, and with the DAX having lost around 25% since the beginning of the year. Investors seem to be feeling some appetite for risk again. Uh, shares of the automotive sector have been in particular demand this morning as well as beaten down uh, shares of technology, travel, and leisure companies. All right, Chris, thank you so much uh, for that update. Uh, we'll certainly meet up with you tomorrow. So let's move to the UK now, where Juliana is standing by. Uh, Juliana, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Business Incorporated, if I say so well. Uh, we, we've been talking a whole lot about the new uh, government, Liz Truss, uh, Kwasi Kwarteng, and uh, once again, we are still on it. So the Prime Minister has not ruled out real terms, uh, benefit cuts, uh, and she's not committing to raising benefits in line with inflation. What are the implications of some of this, you know, tits and bits that we get from every here and there? Good afternoon, Eni, and thank you very much for that kind, pleasant welcome there. So not so pleasant for Liz Truss and her Conservative government at the moment. In fact, I just had a sneaky look on Twitter on my phone whilst you were talking in Berlin. Kemi Badenoch, former British, well, not former, a British, a fellow British Nigerian. She's currently uh, delivering a, a speech at the conference in Birmingham. And I've got to say, according to Twitter, she's doing pretty well. Lots of Conservative MPs were wishing that actually she had become PM and not Liz Truss. But going back to what you were saying about uh, this kind of announcement that was made earlier today by Liz Truss uh, with her not um, committing to raising benefits in line with inflation. That is likely to be a serious problem for her because, of course, we know that she is in a lot of uh, deep mud, shall we say, at the moment. She's only been in um, power for about 28 days. Ten of them, of course, uh, were spent mourning uh, the death of Her Majesty the Queen, and already there have been screeching U-turns talks of resignations and even some sort of coup by Conservative backbenchers. But, of course, because of that screeching U-turn yesterday, she was doing the rounds on British media this morning, basically explaining anything she could away from the 45p tax cut, which has kind of overshadowed all that was supposed to be announced this week. And when pushed and shoved by a journalist um, about whether or not she would 
agree with her predecessor, Boris Johnson, in raising benefits in line with inflation. She just wouldn't commit. Um, and it would cost the Conservative government about £3 billion if they were to do that. And, of course, we know that's money that they just don't have. One of the reasons why the markets were in such a turmoil is because when the mini-budget was announced, all of the spending had no plan of how to pay for it. And so she's um, a little bit cautious with her words at the moment. I think one of the reasons why she she could be able to breathe a small sigh of relief is that it's just been announced by the government that the second instalment of that £650 government support package um, is going to be paid out to about 8, billion, 8 million households by the 9th of November. Uh, they received £326 in August. They're going to receive a further payment. This is basically to help people coping with the cost of living crisis. This is only for people on low or no income. So, of course, the Conservative uh, faithful are going to be looking for some sort of other support measures for middle-income uh, workers. But, yes, it's, it, it's not going great uh, for Liz Truss at the moment. And also this morning, again, during the media, rounds. She failed um, to back Kwasi Kwarteng, who was, during the hustings, her her closest ally. Of course, if you make him chancellor, you, you should be closely knitted on policy. But it's gone dreadfully wrong for him. And I think she feels now that if she clings on to him, then she could go down if he is forced out, uh, too. So, yes, not great, but great for Kebby Badenoch. Yeah, well, uh, I think, Juliana, that just reminds me where they say politicians do not have permanent enemies or friends. So it's just yeah. where, where, where it favours at any time, you know, I think. But, but is, the, is the market favoured at this time? Well, the markets are actually in tip-top shape at the moment. In fact, uh, the FTSE 250, the domestic market, that's boasting triple-digit um, rises. There has been some corporate news. Uh, Greg's, for example, pretty popular bakery chain in the UK, that's just announced its um, second, third quarter results for the weeks, uh, for the six, 12 weeks up to the end of September. They've been doing exceptionally well. And then, of course, what everybody is talking about, which is the British pound, that rallied against the US dollar in early morning Asian trading, almost reaching $1.14, which is good news at the moment. But then, of course, we had um, that uh, forecast from Standard Chartered and Bank of Canada uh, saying that they expect the currency to dip 10% over the next uh, three months. So it's still all to play for. We'll just have to wait and see what other sound bites come out of Birmingham in the next couple of days. Yeah, we'll certainly be following that, Juliana. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Thank you. All right, let's go to Asia now. Asia Pacific shares traded high on Tuesday after stocks on Wall Street rallied overnight. The Nikkei 225 in Japan rose 2.96 to close at 26,000. 992.21, marking the biggest daily gain since March the 23rd. The Topics Index gained 3.21% to close at 1,906.89. South Korea's KOSPI advanced 2.5% to close at 2,209.38. MCSI's Broadex Index of Asia Pacific shares outside Japan gained almost 2%. In Australia, the S&P X200 jumped 3.75% to close at 6,699.3. The Reserve Bank of Australia raised its benchmark interest rate by 25 basis points. Markets in mainland China and Hong Kong are closed for a holiday. In the United States, stock features surged today as Wall Street aimed to build on a sharp rally seen in the previous session. Features for the Dow Jones Industrial Average were up 379 points. There, let's look at the numbers uh, right here. Uh, we see the Dow Jones uh, up there. That's the features, obviously, at 1.28% at 29,920. The S&P features also up more than 1.5% at 3,000. 748.28, while the Nasdaq features uh, up or green market for the United States at this time, or the features, uh, which is what we're reporting, at almost 2% at 11,510. Meanwhile, the yield on the 10-year U.S. Treasury note extended its decline. I was trading at about 3.58% down 
from more than 4% at one point, which it had last week. Oil space now prices edged up on Tuesday as expectations that OPEC Plus may agree to a large cut in crude output when it meets tomorrow outweigh concerns about the global economy. Brent crude features rose 78 cents to $89.64 a barrel after gaining more than 4% in the previous session. U.S. crude features rose by 56 cents to $84.19 a barrel. The benchmark gained more than 5% in the previous session. That's its largest daily gain since May. Our prices rallied yesterday on renewed concerns about supply tightness. Investors expect OPEC Plus to cut output more than uh, 1 million barrels a day at their first in-person meeting since 2020. And of course, that's holding tomorrow. In the metal space, gold extended gains on Tuesday to firm above the key 1,700 per ounce level on a retreat in the dollar and U.S. Treasury yields. As investors expect that the Federal Reserve will turn down its pace of monetary tightening. Spot gold was up 0.12% at 1,701.80 per ounce, having touched its highest in September the 13th at 1,710.49. Earlier in the session, U.S. gold features rose 0.51% to 1,710.60. Gold started the quarter on a solid note, registering on Monday its biggest daily percentage gain since March. As a slowdown in U.S. manufacturing activity raised hopes that the Federal Reserve might be less aggressive going forward. Let's take a break now. When we come back from that break, we have stories from the African continent, beginning with the commodity space. Stay with us. This is Business Incorporated on Channels Television. You're welcome back. Still watching Business Incorporated here on Channels Television. And just as we promised, begin with what's going on in the commodity space. Now, we've been talking a whole lot about cocoa in uh, the how many weeks, but we're still staying on that because Nigeria is the third largest producer and exporter of cocoa, and that's after Ghana and Ivory Coast. In 2019, cocoa production was at over 300,000 tons, but this declined sharply in 2020 to 216,676 tons. And of course, revenue also from there declined to $510,000 uh, from 602 in 2020. Well, uh, recently we've seen a bit of a reversal in that, and we have a lot of factors driving that. But uh, joining us for that conversation, we have China Zoewazo, analyst with Financial Derivatives Company, joining us virtually from Victoria Island. Hi, China Zo. Good afternoon. Thank you for your time this afternoon. Thank you for having me. Oh, awesome. So, uh, uh, China Zo, uh, What's going on in the cocoa space in Nigeria? Um, we do know that uh, Nigeria has a lot of potentials, as usual. Uh, but how much of it are we exploring? How much of those potentials in the cocoa space? I know we have states like Ondo, Cross River States, and all of that as uh, major producers. How much of that are we exploring? Are we going up? Are we going down? Nigeria has currently increased production in cocoa due to the um, investments in the in the in the cocoa industry. So in the in states, in the top producing states in Nigeria, like Ondo and Cross River, there has been increased production of cocoa from, from, from those areas, and there has been increased exports, which has increased the export receipts that Nigeria has been receiving. So it's currently the demand for cocoa has been on the rise since um, since the restrictions, the restriction on COVID-19 was, was lifted. So there is global demand for cocoa. Nigeria is increasing its product, its cocoa production, and we are meeting up, we are almost meeting up with the required demand for global cocoa. So which means in the nearest future there will be equated, equated supply and demand of cocoa driving in, in Nigeria. So that means there's more for Nigeria, there's more, there's, there will be increased export receipts for Nigeria. 
All right, so we, we noticed in recent times, uh, first of all, I think it was the issue of fertilizer, then there was the issue of uh, diseases or pests uh, that drove the price of cocoa up. Uh, unfortunately, Nigeria could not just boost its production to follow suit. But what's happening to the price now, and where is Nigeria in that, uh, in both uh, the biggest or uh, the largest producer in the state, which is Ondo State, and of course, followed by Cross River? Nigeria is the third producer, the third largest producer of cocoa. But the prices of cocoa has been rising, which is a good thing, because that means we get to earn more foreign exchange. So. The, the increase in price is as a result of increased production because there, when there is a higher demand, there is higher, we can supply more to meet up with the demand, which means that we can have a more foreign exchange to, <clears throat> to, um, to take care of the necessary things that we need to take care of in Nigeria. So what about the issue of labor for productivity or equipment? How available is that in Nigeria? Nigeria lacks the adequate. Nigeria lacks adequate um, technology and and equipment for um, for the agricultural sector, which is why the agricultural sector has been neglected for so long. So, if we need we need to invest in the agricultural sector to boost production, especially in the rural areas where farmers don't have access to technology and and high yielding seeds. So, if we can, the government should uh, provide these seeds to the farmers and also provide extension services to these farmers, training programs to train them on modern irrigation, on modern irrigation methods, on modern modern farming methods, modern um, techniques, modern modern techniques that can help to increase productivity and increase yield. All right, uh, Chinazo, thank you so much. Uh, Chinazo, we uh, we still have a lot of work to do, a lot of untapped potential, uh, which is, seems to be a norm in Nigeria. Thank you for your time this afternoon. Well, we're still talking about agriculture, but this time we're going all the way to Turkey, where Window of Turkey, which is a consulting company based in Istanbul, that's the capital, is asking for a more collaborative and intentional relationship with African governments in the area of agricultural development. The founder of the Window of Turkey Limited, Mr. Bara Al Sasa, believes that the private and public sectors need to work hand in hand as all required resources are available. All right, I believe we'll take that track uh, subsequently. We do have a track there for that. But still staying with Turkey, this time Libya and Turkey have signed a memorandum of understanding in the fields of security, training, oil and gas and media. The government said this comes within the context of the strengthening relations between the two countries. The Libyan government reported that the meeting dealt with preparations for holding the Supreme Libyan Turkish Strategic Council in Tripoli and the Libyan Turkish Partnership Forum, which it started and will represent the launch of several important strategic projects. And uh, we move to Uganda, where the cost of internet use in Uganda is the second highest in the world. Wow. And that's according to the research of SawShark, which is a cybersecurity company based in the Netherlands and deals in virtual private network services, data leaks, detection systems, and private search tools. According to SurfShark's latest research of 2022 shows that Uganda's internet affordability ranks 116 out of 117 countries, which is surveyed in the world, or that's 92% of the global population. This means that internet in Uganda is not affordable compared to global standards. To afford mobile internet, Ugandans have to work 510 times more than Israeli citizens for whom the most affordable one gigabyte package costs only five seconds of work monthly. Meanwhile, fixed broadband costs Uganda is citizens around 59 hours of their precious work. And the only country which tops Uganda is Ivory Coast. Not a good story coming from there. 
Well, that's a conversation or that track that uh, we told you about the window of Turkey, talking about uh, asking for collaboration between Africa and Turkey on ag agricultural development uh, is now here. So we'll listen to Mr. Barra. We need Turkey to help us in Africa to transfer the technology, not only to export. And Turkey is willing to do that and interested to do that. So in this level, we want to speak with the governments to help us in this, uh, in this technology transfer. We need also the governments of Africa to organize the land uh, agreements. What we heard uh, from uh, one of the states uh, uh, department, uh, Deputy Governor, uh, Jigawa Deputy Governor, that he said, we have millions of hectares ready to be uh, farmed. So we are speaking about an, a very big opportunity. The land is there, the working force is there, the water is there, and it's all ready to be invested in. Turkey also has very good opportunities, also in agriculture. If we only focused on how to bring all the factors together, we will see that the only issue we have is organizing ourselves in the right way, creating a platform that can host all of us as governments to govern what we are doing and to organize us as a private sector because we are a private sector, we are not representing any government. Well, that's right. According to Mr. Barra there, what we need is organizing ourselves. We have all the resources, even within Nigeria. Well, just before we go, the World Bank Board has approved the third and last in a programmatic a series of three inclusive development policy operations designed to support key reforms that are critical to enabling inclusive growth in Liberia. The financing amounts to $55 million, uh, International Development Association concessional credit, uh, and and 7.50 million in IDA grants will be disbursed as budget support. These reforms will remove distortions in key economic sectors, strengthen public sector transparency, and promote economic and social inclusion. And that's where we draw the curtains on the program today, Business Incorporated. Tomorrow, we'll bring you a fresh episode of Stories from Africa and Around the World. This, I'm Mini John McQuarrie. Enjoy the rest of your day.